Welcome to Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Planting the seed of truth and growing families in the Word of God. We're going to go again on charting your course. And I just have not been able to leave this subject yet. Uh, Week one, we talked about using our words Uh, to chart our course in week two we talked I'm sorry we talked about using his word the first week and the second week we talked about using our words to speak his word to chart our course and then last week we started on imagination and that it's a God-given tool it's a God-given tool to be used Ricky when we use our imagination we can look into the future And we can see if the decision that we're about to make, what we're doing, what we're thinking, what we're putting our attention on is going to take us where we want to go. We can look ahead and have the answer to that. Why? So that we can change course if we need to. If we don't like where it's taking us, I mean, like if you're getting married, for instance, I'll look at a cute little couple in the middle. You can look ahead, and you can look at the future. That's a blessing. A lot of times we just want to look at the right now, and that's when things don't go so well. But we can look ahead. We're going to talk more about the imagination in context of the word. I'm not talking about new age. I'm not talking about anything weird. God gave you your imagination to use for your benefit and for his benefit so we, we talked about 2 Corinthians chapter 10 last week. We talked a lot about our past imaginations, things that have been sown into our minds, either at our will or against our will. And we went to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and I am going to do something I don't think I've ever done before. I took the versions that we read last week and combined them. Because last week I gave you like three different translations of this passage of scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 3. So I conglomerated them with your permission. That's the way I'm going to read it. I just want you to know I'm not reading this straight out of the King James Version. This was the different versions, the parts of those different versions that really clicked for me and I put them together. So when you read this, hang with me. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, And although we live in the natural realm, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We don't wage this military campaign using mere human weapons. But these weapons are mighty. Remember we emphasized that last week. They are mighty through God. They are energized with divine power to effectively pull down, overthrow, dismantle, and destroy any stronghold. Now, we talked a lot last week about what a stronghold is, and I want to emphasize this again to you because it's important. A stronghold, when you look it up in the Greek, it can either be a stronghold as in a fortress, or we talked last week, it can also be a prison. And I was reading a little bit from Rick Renner, who's one of my favorite Greek guys. And he said, here's the thing. A fortress keeps invaders from getting in. But a prison keeps insiders from getting out. If we have strongholds in our mind, ways, strong patterns of thinking that have been reinforced by thinking that way and thinking that way and thinking that way, or strongholds that have been reinforced and fortified by things happening to us over and over and over again. Life did this to you and then something else happened and that fortified that way of thinking. Talking to anybody in the house? Okay. Do you know that once you're abused, the, ch- the chances of being abused again gets even greater? That's not at your fault. I'm not saying that. However, this is how we, be, we get into a victim mentality. And once we enter a victim mentality, we tend to draw 
victimizers. That's a tough word. I'm just being honest with you. Not your fault. I'm not saying that what people did to you is your fault. But at some point, we've got to go, I'm losing this victim, this victim mentality because I'm through being victimized. Okay? So this is what we're talking about, how to, con how to handle these, these things in our mind. And Paul has given us all this wisdom. And something I'd never noticed before was this word, I mean, I've noticed the word warfare, but I've never really thought about what it meant. And I was doing some reading, and, and I found where, where they talked about this for the weapons of our warfare, that warfare is strategic, it's a strategic military campaign. And I wanted to really call this, we're waging war. In our minds, I'm ready to wage war and get rid of some things to tear down some things, to break loose some things, and then to establish what God wants in my head so that I can do his will and purpose. There's so much that needs to be done in this world, and we're so self-consumed. We're so caught in these prisons. And when you're in prison, you can't go wage war. But if you have a fortress, you can wage war without the enemy hurting you. So you can go set the captive free from your fortress. That's where I want to be. That's where you want to be. I believe it. I didn't finish the scripture, did I? Dismantle, destroy any strongholds. Casting down. Man, that's a powerful, that's a violent act. And I talk to myself. I talk to my head when I'm having thoughts that I know are stronghold and not a fortress, then I have to, I talk to myself. And sometimes I talk to myself rough. No, you're not going there. You're not going to let that thought go any further. Some of you need to be talking to yourselves. Casting down, refuting, demolishing every deceptive fantasy. We talked about fantasies a little bit last week. I kind of got on my soapbox a little bit, and I hope it went over okay. Apparently, the people that were sitting right here, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Somebody sits there next week, don't think. Every deceptive fantasy, theory, or mental argument that exalts itself against what? The knowledge of God. Anything that exalts itself or opposes or defies what God says I have a responsibility to get rid of that thought, to cast down that imagination. That, that lies on me. We're to, we're to defy it. And we bring into captivity, like prisoners of war, every wrong thought. I like that. We lead every thought and purpose away captive and insist that it bow to the obedience of Christ, the anointed one. And that's what we were supposed to be working on this week. And I don't know about y'all, but I had plenty of opportunity. We've been talking about charting our course. And this is just another aspect of it. Because if we can look ahead and we can see where we want to be, we know what we need to get rid of and we know what we need to start building. And I, I, I titled this message, Imagine That. Imagine that. The truth is, if, if what you're seeing is wrong, it can't go right. If you see marriage wrong, it can't go right. If you see raising children wrong, it can't go right. If you see God wrong, it can't go right. We've got to go in the Word. We've got to find the truth. We have to change our thoughts. We read that from Isaiah last week. We've got to change our thoughts to His thoughts and our ways to His ways. His Word, His Word is trying to paint a new picture for you. And how He can take this, this one book and He can paint a picture for Kathy for her life and Eugene for his life, 
and Jeff for his life and Sammy for his life out of the same book can paint a picture and that's not all look the same. He's such a personal God. And he sees you. And, and that shouldn't be a scary thing. I need to be transparent before him. I am transparent before him, whether I think I am or not. The fig leaves didn't work too well in Genesis, did they? <laughs> right? And, and so letting him see and knowing that where he wants to take us is a good thing. Jesus died for that. Then we should be willing to let him show us where we're thinking wrong. And let him paint that new image. I just went through, and I'm just going to read these really quickly. So if you just want to jot them down in your notes, or if you want to get the QR code at the entrances uh, where you can have these. But the new image, the image that he has of you. You know, we, we, we quote Jeremiah 29, 11 a lot. It's, it's on a lot of decor now and homes. But it's so true. He knows the thoughts he thinks towards you. The trouble is, do you know the thoughts he thinks towards you? Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you hope and to give you a future. Amen. Romans 8, 29, for those God foreknew, he also predestined. He predestined them to be conformed to the likeness of his son. How do you see Jesus? Then you start gravitating towards that image. That he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Do brothers just resemble? <laughs> and those he predestined, he, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Everybody say, I'm justified. I'm justified. And I'm glorified. And I'm glorified. We're kind of used to that justified part, but that glorified part? Well, we're in Christ, aren't we? Our life is hid in him, is it not? 1 Corinthians 15, 49, And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. Amen. 2 Corinthians 3, 17, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory. What? I'm just trying to stretch you here. I'm just trying to stretch myself here. This is what the Word says about you. You reflect the Lord's glory. Now, if I wake up in the mornings and I have this fortress built that that's who I am, that will guide my steps. It'll change how I walk. It'll change how I talk. It'll change what I do. So we're trying to change ourselves by sheer willpower. Got to have a new image. He provides it for us. We are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. That is what the Word says. Thing is, we're not keeping that scripture in front of us. We're keeping other things in front of us. Colossians 3, 2 says, Set your minds and keep them set on what is above the higher things, not on the things that are on this earth. For as far as this world is concerned, you have died and your new real life is hidden with Christ in God. That's, that's a hallelujah for me. My life is hidden in him. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in the splendor of his glory. Verse 9, you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Imagine that. You in the image of your creator. Is that not Genesis? Yes. We were created like him. Man, is God's word the truth? Is it the highest truth? You know, I think sometimes we need to stand in front of the mirror and say, okay, what's the truth? What I'm feeling? 
or what he says? What's, what's, what's really the truth? What I'm thinking they think or what he thinks? Because see, this culture is so into emoji life. This is how I'm feeling. This is how I'm feeling. Everything written for kids right now, just about anything, unless Bridget wrote it, thank God for godly children's book author, is about their feelings. How they feel. What's the truth? Who has the truth? Let me tell you, we can't rely on our emotions for the truth. They lie. They lie. We can't rely on our circumstances as being the truth. And people who think, oh, this is true, God arranges everything. No, we are not chess pieces on a chessboard. This is not Greek mythology here. This is Christianity. And so we take his word and we conform our life to it because of that image, that his word. You are healed by the stripes of Jesus. You, you are. You are healed by the stripes of Jesus. You are forgiven. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The joy of the Lord, it is your strength. And you may have to look in the mirror and you may have to tell that person that you're looking at that what they're feeling is not the truth. That's not in my notes, but that's good. You know, when you stand in front of the mirror, you just have to make sure that the mirror you're standing in front of is the truth. When you look at yourself, you have to make sure that what you're looking at is the truth. Go with me to James chapter 1. We'll get into this morning's message. <laughs> I'm going to read this to you out of the Amplified. It's James 1, and I'm going to start in verse 21. I'll wait till I quit hearing the pages turn. I thank you that you, you look up scripture on your devices and in your Bibles so that you can read them for yourself. Never stop doing that. Verse 21, so get rid of all uncleanliness and the rampant outgrowth of wickedness and in a humble and gentle, modest spirit, receive and welcome the word which implanted and rooted in your hearts contains the power to save your soul. Now, if you were in Brenda's uh, Spirit, Soul, Body Balance class uh, Thursday night, she talked a lot about the soul, what the soul is. You can kind of sum it up with, it's your mind, your will, and your emotions, okay? It's that thinking part of you. And he says, to get rid of these things, how? You're going to receive and welcome the word which implanted and rooted in your heart contains the power this explosive, dynamic, miraculous power to save your mind. To save your emotions. To save your will. The Word of God can do that if you receive the Word of God and let it become a part of you. How do I do that? Keep it in front of you. Keep it in front of you. Speak it. Speak it. Say it. Say it. Imagine that. Remember we talked about meditation last week from the scripture. Godly meditation. And it meant to, to mutter, to, Jimmy gave me the word ponder, perfect word. Ponder what the scripture's saying. Imagine it. That's what that word means. You can go to the Greek, look it up. That's what it means. So when you read what God says about you, you don't just read it. You start talking to yourself about it. I mean, let's face it. You talk about what the other people said about you. <laughs> let's try talking about what God said about us. And let's just see what a difference that makes. Let's face it. You rehearsed, you saw what happened over and over again in your mind. You replay it. You bring it up. Why not? Let's, let's just 
work on bringing something a little different up. That's meditation. That's godly, scriptural meditation. So when you read a scripture, I love memory verses. I love that our children's church sends the memory verse uh, home with the kids because, you know, when you, when you put them to bed at night and you, you go over that memory verse, tell them, let's imagine this. Let's imagine this. What does this look like? Get them to talk about it. Have them imagine it. Have them get vivid with it. And you will teach them how to meditate the word and they'll be far, far, far above where we are where we've meditated the wrong things. So meditate the word. That's what you're going to do. It's how you get it implanted and rooted in your hearts where you can see it. When you read, by his stripes I am healed, can you see it? When you read, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, can you see it? Well, I can't see it. Then keep meditating it. Keep meditating that word. Verse 22. It has the, the power to save your soul. But be doers of the word. Obey the message. And not merely listeners to it, betraying yourselves Hmm. King James Version says deceiving yourselves into deception by reasoning contrary to the truth. Hmm. Reasoning contrary to the truth. For if anyone only listens to the word without obeying it and being a doer of it, he is like a man who looks carefully at his face in a mirror. For he thoughtfully observes himself and then goes off and promptly forgets what he was like. But he who looks carefully into the faultless law, the law of liberty, he's talking about the word of God there, and is faithful to it and perseveres in looking into it, being not a heedless listener who forgets, but is an active doer who obeys it, he shall be blessed in his doing in his life of, in his life of obedience. I like some words in there. There's some words I really, really stood out to me. Be faithful to it. Be faithful to the word. And I know we say this all the time, and we're going to keep saying it all the time. Read your Bible. It is the word of God to you. It is the word of God for you. It is the word of God. And he's trying to paint a picture of who he created you to be, and you're not, putting any, you're not handing him the paintbrush. He needs his word in you to develop in you so that you can become who he created you to be. Be faithful to it and persevere looking into it. Keep looking, keep looking, keep looking, keep looking, keep looking, keep looking. You remember the serpent on the pole? The only way those people were saved is that they kept looking at it. Don't take your eyes off of it. Be a doer of what it says. Let it affect how you live. And sometimes that being a doer of the word is simply speaking in line with it. Thinking in line with it. You may think, well, what am I supposed to do when I read that scripture? What am I supposed to do? If there's not something obvious that you're supposed to do, speak it, think it, meditate it. That might be your obedience to the word. Cast down thoughts. I'm not thinking that. I am thinking this. That might be your doing. And that is a powerful doing and it'll change things for you. When you start seeing yourself in his word, you will gravitate towards his will. And then this sheer willpower of trying to is suddenly a, a guiding and a leading instead of me trying to force myself not to do something I start gravitating. Did you know when you're walking, and, and I know I've used this example a lot, but when Tanya and I are walking, we go towards what we're looking at. And if we're looking at something across the ditch, the ditch is on its way. <laughs> I mean, it just happens. You, when you're driving, you gravitate towards what you're looking at, and that's why you find yourself jerking the wheel. You're like, oh, getting off course here. That's such a great example. If we're looking at his will, my Bible's down there, his word is his will. If you don't get anything else out of coming here, please know that God's word is his will. 
And when you read his word, you're reading his will. When you speak his word, you're speaking his will. When you imagine his word, you're imagining his will. And so that's what we want to be looking at, then we'll gravitate toward it. If we're looking at our circumstance and situation, guess what? We gravitate towards it. We see the negative of this whole imagination thing in Genesis 6. And he's, he's dealing, this is in the time of Noah. And most of you probably remember Noah from your Sunday school lessons uh, back in the day. Long, long ago, we had these things called flannel graph boards. Thank you, all the old people in the room. And I can still see the, the ark and the waves and the water and the animals. But in Genesis 6, 5, God is observing the earth. It says, and God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Sometimes I think we're real close to being there again. You ever feel like Noah, like the only righteous family left on the earth? It's one great thing to come to church and to look around and go, okay, okay, there's still, there's still a remnant, right? God looked and he saw that every, every, every imagination of the thoughts of mankind's heart was evil continually. So you know what was happening? Man was gravitating towards evil. To such a point that it says God repented that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart that he had created him. Well, it really grieved him at his heart that man had done this. That man had let this go so far. You know how that happened? How did it get to this point? One thought at a time. One thought at a time. One person at a time. Exposure happened. When I read this, God brought my attention to that word imagination, of course, because of what we're teaching on. But I knew I was supposed to look it up. God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of, his, of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That word imagination, it means intellectual framework. That's what the Strong's Concordance, the Greek Concordance says. I'm sorry, the Hebrew. Intellectual framework. And God just dropped this word in my spirit and I could just, I could see it. I'm a visual learner. Infrastructure. Your imagination is your infrastructure. It's taking you somewhere. It's building. It's a framework. It's becoming something. Don't think that you can just imagine something and it not be building something. It's infrastructure. It's framework. It's intellectual framework. And that's why Corinthians, why Paul told us, you have got to cast down that imagination. If it wasn't structural, you wouldn't have to cast it down. And if you've never listened to, uh, help me think of her name. No, 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 no. The doctor, the neurologist, Carolyn Leaf. Oh my goodness. If you're really dealing with this infrastructure, things, strongholds built in your brain, Dr. Carolyn Leaf, absolutely amazing, talks about the actual real estate of your brain that a thought takes up when you take it, when you take a thought. Absolutely fascinating. You have to cast these things down. And, and we can't just pretend like they're not doing something. And that is the lie of the devil from the pit of hell in our society right now. With all this fantasy stuff that he's put into place, all the, the games that he's put into place, and I know there's good ones. Hip, hip, hooray, go have fun, yes. Play golf on a computer. I don't care. 
use your little goggles and go out there on the golf course and pretend like you're playing. That's great. But when it starts crossing a line into anything that is not godly and killing people, murdering people, is not godly, church. And I am not going to be afraid to say it from the pulpit every time I'm up here if I have to. We've got to be careful what we're building in here. It is infrastructure, and we are building the road ahead of us. We're building the road ahead of us. It will take us somewhere. And in Genesis 6, we see that with mankind. On the flip side of this, on the positive side of this, we have a man named Abram, later known as Abraham, who God... God told him to look from where he was, right? Where he currently was, to what God had given him. He said, stop looking at where you are and look to the land I have given you. That's what God's doing this morning. Stop looking at where you are and look to the land I've given you. So go with me to Genesis 13 and let's look at a couple of things There's so much of the story of Abraham. Of course, it's chapters and chapters. Well, it's books. I try to just pick some things out. Genesis 13. This is when God, you know, first is approaching Abraham. And he said, uh, verse 14, Lift up your eyes from where you are and look. That's a whole lesson right there. Lift up your eyes from where you are and look north, south, east, and west. All the land that you... All the land that you see, I'll give to you. What about the land you can't see? Can't give it to you. What can you see? That whole New Testament is your land. Amen. That's your land. That's the promised land right there. Amen. And God says, quit looking at where you are and look to what I've given you and anything you can see, it's yours. Amen. I'll give it to you. And to your offspring, what? Oh yeah, what you see it's affecting the next generation. Amen. It's affecting the next generation. Your, I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth. How many children did Abram have at this time? Zero. I'll make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. You know what God's doing? He's got out his paintbrush. He's showing him the dust, the sand, and he's going, this is how many. This is what your offspring's going to look like. Well, that is not how Abram saw himself. Abram had zero children. God's trying to paint a different picture on the inside of Abram. How? By God's words. He's a master at it. He's a master at speaking and being able to put an image on the inside of you of strength, of wholeness, of perfection, of health. I'll make your offspring like the dust of the earth. Go, listen to this, verse 17. Go, walk through the length and the breadth of the land. Experience it. Take it. Go walk through it, for I am giving it to you. So what did Abram do? Verse 18. So Abram moved his tent. That's obedience. He received that word. So Abram moved his tent, and he went and lived in what God promised him. He went and lived near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. He never quit acknowledging where it came from. God had to give him some help 
building his infrastructure. <laughs> this is not where Abram was, but he moved to where God wanted him to be. This was not how Abram saw himself, but God began to paint a picture on the inside of him. Go down to Genesis 15. This is one of my favorite parts. Genesis 15, verse 2. And Abram said, Abram still has zero children. Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless. How did Abraham see how did Abram see himself? Childless. This is important. He saw himself childless. God, what are you going to give me seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is going to be my heir. Because you've given me no seed. Verse 4, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. Oh, paintbrush. Here comes the paintbrush. Abram, this is how you see yourself. But here comes the paintbrush. God's word. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, This shall not be your heir. Oh, well. That just changed the canvas. That just changed the plan. If he receives it, if Abram receives the word that just came to him, this is going to change everything. This will not be your heir. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And God took him out. And he said, look toward heaven and tell the stars. If you are able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. Paintbrush. Paintbrush. And he believed in the Lord. And he counted it to him for righteousness. Now without going through the rest of Genesis, what happened? First thing that happened was time. Not seeing manifested what God had spoken. And so Abram and his wife decided they would help God out. And they brought in the maid, and obviously the word worked for Abraham, I mean Abram, because he and the maid had Ishmael. That was not what God had in mind. And so we had a mess there because two women, it ain't going to work. I don't care what sister wives tells you, <laughs> ain't going to work. So God has to deal with that mess. And then he thinks, okay, I've showed you the dust. I've showed you the stars. I've told you how this is going to happen. You know, God, we got to bring back out the paintbrush. We, he had not got it yet. He says, I'm going to change your name. You got to identify yourself differently if you're going to live differently. And, and that's so beautiful to me because we've been, when we got saved, Scripture calls it, we've been born again. We are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things have, behold all things. Yeah. He says, I want you to start calling yourself Abraham. Now, Abraham has, Abram has a choice. And he takes that word. He takes God's word, and he, he's a doer of it. And he begins to introduce himself as Abraham, the father of a multitude. That's what his name means, the father of a multitude. Not only that, God changes Sarai's name, because she needs a new identity. And he makes her princess. <laughs> she needed a new identity. And then guess what? When they start saying what God said and picturing 
even to other people. Names meant something back then. Then the perception began to change and their reality began to change. And Isaac, the promised child, is born. But God had to get Abram to imagine that. And that's what he's working on us this morning. You're forgiven. Imagine that. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Imagine that. Just as you're reading the scripture this week, end it with imagine that. Imagine that. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Imagine that. The joy of the Lord's my strength. Imagine that. I can run through a troop and jump over a wall. Imagine that scripture. Imagine that. I'm going to need that in the next couple of weeks. So I think that's a good one for me. I'm going to imagine that. Your sleep is sweet. Imagine that. Can y'all do that? Imagine that. Just start adding it. When you hear a scripture, just add it. Now, if you really want a fun study, I'm going to close, but if you really want a fun study, it really kind of brings a lot of these lessons together. You can go to Genesis 11 and read about the, the story of the Tower of Babel. Because the story of the Tower of Babel really talks about the power of communication, words, and unity, and imagination. And I'm just going to give you one one verse out of that story, but I encourage you to go read it this week. Genesis 11, 6, and the Lord 6 said, The Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. Can you hand me that black book beside you there? Yeah, that one. Behold, the people is one. And we all have one language. This is our word. What happened? Now, they weren't, they weren't doing this on the word. Okay? The Tower of Babel people weren't doing this on the word. They were there to make a name for themselves, to build a tower that would reach to the heavens to make a name for themselves. And he said, Behold, the people is one, and they all have one language. And this they began to do. And now nothing... No thing, nothing, nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Y'all are going to you're gonna have to think on that. So God confounded their language. He, he, he confused their language so they weren't speaking the same thing. Therefore, they could not cast the vision because if they could cast the vision... He said they could do it. He said nothing could be restrained from them. So on the positive side of that, God has given us his word. And we can unite on his word. We can cast a vision to each other from this word. We can begin to imagine each other and ourselves through this word. And nothing that this word cast an image of can be restrained from us. That's powerful. That's powerful. Amen. Y'all can stand. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. We pray that this message has uplifted, encouraged, and motivated you today. You can find us online at rccenter.org or visit us at 305 Lakefront Drive, Russellville, Arkansas.